Now, I would like to uh, introduce to everyone um, our Vice President, Lynette Griffin, and she's going to be uh, bringing on our first uh, presenter uh, to really put a face on this crisis. Uh, Lynette. Thank you, Georgette, and welcome everyone. Of all the forms of inequality and injustice in healthcare, this is the most shocking and inhumane. As we move through Black History Month, these words of Dr. King resonate deeply with what we know as the Black maternal health crisis. Both a healthcare and moral crisis that has not skipped over this great state of California. I would rather be introducing your first speaker for her work as a nurse, healer, life coach, and founding member of the Gathering Spot. But instead, she's joining us to tell the story of her cousin, April Valentine, and put a face on the tragedy and loss this healthcare crisis is leaving in its wake. Ms. Mykesha Mack. Mykesha, thank you for joining us this morning, this evening. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to share um, just kind of like a collage we have of my cousin here. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Mykesha Mack. Um, as Ms. Griffin said, I am a life coach. I am a speaker. I am a certified um, nurse mental health and healing coach, uh, AKA the nurse healer. So I help nurses to heal from emotional trauma, mental burnout, and just toxic workplace culture and different things like that. And um, I also do DEI consulting as well. So I'm just honored to be in this space with y'all. Um, it does suck. It's very unfortunate that we're in this space the way that we are, um, but I'm always honored and ready and willing to speak um, on behalf of my family, you know, my cousin amplifying her story. And so again, my name is Makisha Mack. I am April Valentine's, um, one of her closest cousins. We have some some more of her cousins here on this call um, who's part of our team, the Justice for April team. And um, for those who don't know the story, April Valentine was um, a 31 year old first time mother. Uh, she was obviously my cousin, but she was more like a sister. They say your cousins are like your first best friend, right? You know, and since her passing and the loss of her, um, I'm like, man, that was my girl. You know, that was my heart. She had a piece of my heart as my baby. You know, we would, you know, hang out all the time, not just growing up, but even, you know, recently before she passed, just talking about how excited she was to be a mother, um, but just taking it a little bit kind of back in, in time. April was not only our cousin, but she was um, a, a true friend, what many would call a true friend. Like y'all know those friends who you just have who ride for you no matter what. You like, you can be kind of wrong too and that person still ride for you. Um, that was April. April was very loyal and she was um, always there. Like you call on April for whatever, she's gonna be there. And as soon as you she meets you, you're going to be her family. You know, I have friends to this day who are known as April's cousin. You know, I'm like, hey, this is my best friend. Oh, hey, cousin. That was April. Um, she was so just loving, so giving, so loyal. And uh, she was really just a, a pillar to many people, not just in our family, but to many people in, in the community. Um, and so having that type of personality, having being that type of woman, um, who's so good with people and not just good with people. She was great with kids and she always desired to be a mom. April was just that person who was just naturally kind of just good with people, good with kids. She worked with kids. Uh, she worked actually at a group home with uh, younger kids, trouble teens and things like that, because she just had that heart. And so um, we were always talk about, it was April, uh, myself and one of our other cousins, Alexis was probably on this call who was kind of like the trio. We were always talk about, well, who's going to have a baby first? Who's going to get married first? Y'all know those conversations you have when you're little, who's going to be the first? And so we were also excited because April was the first to bear children, um, you know, on her own. And so it was super exciting for us. And when she told us, we were super excited. 
um, and just so thrilled. We couldn't believe it. Like, dang, you about to be a mom. This is crazy. You know, we're all so excited. And so, um, and April was really excited. It was an honor and it was really a dream for her to be a mother. It was one of her literal life goals. She wanted to be a mom so bad. And so you can imagine the level of excitement, not only we had, but she had, um, as a mom, you know, as someone getting ready to be a first time mom. So, um, what many people don't know is that April's mom had, or I'm sorry, April's dad, um, our uncle had just passed. So April's dad just passed probably about three months ago or maybe four, maybe four or five. Um, but it was just a few months shy before April had passed. And so she was very, um, just discouraged and kind of like feeling down because her dad obviously wouldn't get the chance to meet her baby, which she was so excited to have a baby so that she could meet him. But unfortunately he passed before he could meet baby Anaya. And unfortunately she passed before she could meet baby Anaya. And so kind of fast forward throughout this story, April was just um, excited and ready to be a mom. She had done everything she, you know, knew to do. She got a doula, you know, um, April knew of the statistics of being a black mom and kind of what that meant that black women are three to four times more likely to pass away during the process of childbearing due to things like implicit bias and things like that. Um, but she was ready. She said, you know what, I'm gonna do my part. She had her doula, her and her doula kept in contact literally daily, like April. I didn't even know, but I spoke with her doula recently. She's like, yeah, we walked like six miles the week that Anaya was due, you know, um, we walked six miles one day. She said we walked four miles the next day. So April was doing literally everything she knew to do uh, right during the process um, of having baby Anaya. And so the day that she went in, and I want to be clear, I tell this story on account of uh, April's uh, partner, Nigel Robertson, as well as um, my cousin, Keisha, who is April's sister. They were actually there. And so I tell this story from, you know, what they have told us, um, being the spokesperson for the Justice for April campaign. But um, on the day that April was assigned to give birth, uh, Monday, January 9th, she went into the hospital preparing to give birth to baby Anaya, and her doctor was supposed to meet her there. Um, upon going into Centinella Hospital, you know, they asked, hey, where's your maternity ward I'm assigned to give birth today? And they asked, literally, what, what is that? What is a maternity ward? You know, they did not know what that was. Um, and so they were like, well, you know, labor and delivery They said, oh, okay. Yeah. So they had them fill out a bunch of paperwork. They went upstairs, um, and they told April things, you know, like when she had to change her clothes, they told her to strip, you know, instead of saying, Hey, you know, change your clothes or, you know, put on this gown. Um, they told her things like strip. And so it was already kind of an eerie feeling. They said when they first got in there, they knew something wasn't right. You know, just the way they were being treated. They didn't offer April any water no ice or, you know, just things like that as you prepare to give birth being a first time mom. Um, and so they kind of already felt eerie feeling, you know, time goes by, didn't offer April any food till like the next day. But even during that time between Monday and early Tuesday, April started being, you know, more in pain and she was complaining of pain. And so they gave her an epidural, um, but they asked for the doctor several times because the doctor promised to meet her there and the doctor never showed up. Um, at this point, you know, Tuesday, two o'clock in the morning, they gave her the epidural. Um, she started complaining of leg pain and they said, oh, that's normal. That's normal. It's totally fine. You know, and she's like, well, I'm not feeling right. You know, and they continue to complain of leg pain. She continue, continued to ask for the doctor. They said, no, we can, cannot call the doctor because um, the doctor will cuss us out. They, they said that to them because they was afraid that the doctor would be mad at them if they continued to call the doctor. And so they did not call the doctor um, and the doctor did not show up to, I want to say about four o'clock on Tuesday per April's partner, Nigel. And so 4 p.m. rolls around on Tuesday, um, you know, and the doctor comes in and she says, you know, hey, I just, excuse me, got off my boat. And, um, you know, we're not, they're not worried about you being on a the boat. They're worried about, you know, April's health and this us having this baby or April having this baby. And so uh, kind of fast forward, April, shortly after, um, when the doctor comes in, she busts April water bag, and um, April kind of goes into labor a bit, but shortly after that, April stopped breathing, um, and um, kind of long story short, I'm, I'm really kind of summing this up, but there's so many details of this story, um, but shortly after she stopped breathing, and no one touched April, you know, 
no one, meaning the medical staff at that point, heard Nigel, um, April's partner and her sister. And so uh, Nigel, April's partner, was doing CPR in April um, because the nurses did not touch her at all. You know, they stood there in complete shock and did nothing. Um, and so Nigel stopped doing CPR. He ran into the hallway and continued to yell for help. Help, you know, she's not breathing. And more nurses ran into the room, um, but they still did nothing. And um, at one point, one nurse did put an oxygen mask on her, but they did not turn the machine on. And so you can imagine time is going, time is ticking, it's of the essence, April's not breathing. Um, and so probably approximately about five minutes uh, went past and Dr. Gwen comes in the room, she comes back into the room and she shakes April and um, she says, hey, give me a crash cart. Nurses still don't move. And eventually they moved because she kind of got louder and said, hey, get me a crash cart. And so eventually they move. It's a lot going on, a lot of emotions. They get April out of the room and they had to do an emergency C-section to get the baby out. Um, we thank God that Anaya did survive. Um, she's beautiful, just like her mother. And I think she's on on the one of the pictures on the, the screen there. But um, yeah, so during this time, our family is getting notified, hey, something's going on with April, uh, please pray, you know, but we're not knowing the details. And so this story that I tell you, it was not known to me um, immediately at that point when I was notified that something was going wrong. You know, we prayed and I'm praying down heaven. I'm like, God, please, you know, because this was so unexpected for our family, right? Um, eventually April passes away and our family comes to see her and, you know, we're in shock. Literally, we're in shock because we did not expect this. This was the last thing we expected, the very last thing. I mean, I, we didn't expect it at all. So even to be here to continue to talk about and amplify April's story, it's still kind of surreal to, to myself, our family, our team. Um, but we now become advocates in this fight for uh, brown and black mothers to really fight for their rights, to understand and to educate themselves um, we've experienced tons of black backlash recently, even, you know, um, about the doctor, why did she go there and all these different things. I don't think April knew, I doubted April knew uh, what was going on with that hospital. I didn't know, you know, I know many people didn't know, but many people did know, but I'm assuming April did not know about the doctor, you know, her negligence, as well as, um, you know, the hospital. And so now we're in this fight to help educate you know, other young women and people in this space, whether you're a mom or, you know, a brother, an aunt, wherever you find yourself in this space, um, we're here to amplify the story and to let it be known kind of what can happen and things that can happen during this process of, of childbearing. So many balls were dropped and I really, I, I really hate, and I know we all do, that April um, was treated this way. You know, it, it is really heartbreaking and um, when I tell the story, you know, people are like, no way, you know, no, that that didn't happen in 2023. Yes, it happened in 2023, which is why we must still fight, which is why we must still use our voice, you know, um, and we're here for a reason. And so I want to commend all of you for being in this fight, for joining spaces like this to educate yourself, because even in DEI, I did not know. I knew but it's, it's different when you know logically and when you know from experience, it hits totally different. And so um, I pray that no one ever has to know this space from experience, but I pray that we can be a vessel and an advocate um, for you all to help educate and to help bring awareness to issues like this. And um, one thing we don't want is for April's life to be in vain. So we've been just doing what we know to do just kind of acting or reacting rather, protesting at the hospital, protesting at Dr. Gwen Allen's office, making it known, amplifying April's story, letting people know, um, you know, what has happened and how they can take action in this fight. You know, we're asking people, if you've had a story or a similar story, know someone who's had a similar story at Sentinella Hospital to reach out to us. We're building up a case right now to let people know that this is not just a one-off experience. So many black and brown lives are being lost, but they didn't they didn't have the support that April did. They didn't have the team that April did. So that's why we're here. So if you know of anybody, please 
let us know. And please follow our Justice for April page um, because we're continuing to give updates on just things that we can do next or things that we're doing next in this fight. Uh, we've also had a chance to meet with Inglewood City uh, Council. We went down there. They just gave us their condolences. So you said we said, you know what? We're going to go to the Board of Supervisors. We went to the Board of Supervisors by the grace of God. Um, we've got Holly J. Mitchell and her team really on board with us. And we were able to get a five signature letter um, from you know all the Board of Supervisors to get an investigation to send to state officials like Governor Newsom, like excuse me, like, um, you know, hold on, my, what was my thing? Senator Bradford, you know, Tina McKenna, Assembly Member Tina McKenna, so many other folks to help bring justice for April and get an investigation done on what happened to April and to look into this. This hospital, unfortunately, is a private owned hospital. So we've learned so many nuances and things like that that's happened and why we have to kind of go through different layers and so much red tape. So, but we've been able to do this and we won't stop. We just met with Senator Bradford last week and his team is on board with us. And actually we filed a complaint against the hospital and the federal government is looking into this. And so there's so much movement and traction um, again, by the grace of God and just by us refusing to give up in this work. We have a long fight ahead of us. We've met with people like Charles Johnson, um, who's the, the head of four Kira for moms. His wife passed away at Cedar Sinai Hospital, you know, which is a, a better, you know, hospital, but it's still happening in spaces like this and not just inner city hospitals. So we just thank you all for your time. Again, you can follow us at Justice, the number four in April. Um, to get more call to actions every week. We're kind of releasing more new things that we're going to do. Um, so yes, please use your voice, tell your story, uh, reach out if you have any personal stories that you can share with us because we want to get this story out and we don't want April's life to be in vain. But thank you all again for showing up and uh, supporting. Thank you so much for, for being here and uh amplifying her story with us, Mikeisha. We're going to have you back a little later for our full panel. Uh, okay. But I also want to, you know, let everyone know that Mikeisha and I had a wonderful conversation the other night. And Afram is more than happy to work with you and to uh, have you talk to our, our Black Maternal Health Committee as well, um, so that this doesn't happen to any other uh, woman of color, any other Black mother, brown mother. Um, this is a tragedy that could have been avoided, and um, we should all not rest until it doesn't happen again.